So we'll move on to our last presenter of the afternoon. Uh, uh, Sarah Flora is going to talk with us about um, molding techniques for simulation models. So Sarah comes from Geisinger uh, Medical Center, and uh, Sarah has an uh, MR, uh, it's a technologist with an MR background, and um, Geisinger has several facilities, and so Sarah is uh, leading the, uh, the 3D printing lab at work. So we're interested to hear about molding and how it can be applied. Sarah. Hi, everybody. I just wanted to thank uh, the SIG, RSNA SIG, for allowing me to come today, too. This is great. So, uh, my name, once once again, Andy said, Sarah Flora. I'm the lead tech in Guy Singer's 3D print lab and image, imaging lab. And I'll just run through uh, our background here so I have nothing to disclose. Guy Singer is a health system that is located mainly in Pennsylvania. We have some sites in New Jersey as well. 13 hospitals, three level one trauma centers. Uh, we also have two research centers, two simulation centers. We have a medical school and our uh, own health plan. Geisinger 3D Printing Lab was established in 2015 and it's housed in the radiology department at our main campus in Danville. We're staffed by eight technologists that are skilled in medical segmentation and we have five printers. So since 2015, we've been doing a lot of uh, really innovative things and I actually got the chance to come to RSNA last year and I heard about some molding techniques and it, it kind of blew my mind. <laughs> I was really excited about it. And when I came back, I was talking about molding and they're like, yeah, yeah, but why? Why molding? Why wouldn't you just 3D print these things? So that's what I say. Why molding? So you can achieve more realistic parts um, right now. Some of the printers are not um, available to have those realistic models yet. So that's the only other way we can do it. We can pump some silicone into some molds and this is great for simulation models because why would you not want to simulate realistic tissue? Another good thing about molding is the ability to combine 3D printed parts in with the molds. So you can do 3D printed bones, in with silicone, uh, tumors and epoxy. We even uh, put mesh in some skin layers so it holds sutures. And the really good thing about molding is one, one printed mold can make multiple simulation models out of it. So what's the difference between designing a 3D model versus designing a mold? So there's a couple similarities at first. Uh, you're still gonna have to get that data. You're still gonna have to get DICOM, CT, MRI. And you still have to segment the parts that you want to hold. And you're also going to have to fix those parts. But this is where it kind of uh, branches off. So after you fix the parts, normally when you're designing a 3D printed model, you're going to uh, design from there. So you're going to do your Boolean operations, hollow it if you need to, put positioning pegs. After that, you're going to label. You're either going to label with, with a unique patient identifier, any orientations you need, and then you're going to check your contours. So when you design a mold, you're going to go right into your checking your contours, and then you can create that mold. After you create the mold, we're going to design the mold so you can split it up how you need it, add fill holes, exhaust holes, labels, all that good stuff, and then it comes back together and you export those files for free. So the easiest way to uh, just explain what I'm doing is to show you one model from start to finish. So literally from the CAT scan to the model we did. So this is a lower leg traumatic wound that I simulated. It has 3D printed uh, the tibia and the fibula, uh, muscle fat and skin layers for different shore values, and that skin is suturable as well. So like I said, that acquisition is the same as uh, any 3D printed model. This is one of our forms that we have on our internal website for uh, physician reference, just to make sure you, you have the best imaging first. Segmentation is also the same as a 3D printed model. So you're just gonna segment on, uh, in this case, like I said, the bones, the muscle, fat, skin. You'll be able to see when I turn this too that uh, that's where we simulated the wound. Part fixing is also the same. So this is when you approve your mesh, you wrap your surfaces, you're gonna run a diagnostic test for each print. Um, and as you can see, I always say when you have uh, all green check marks, we uh, bob or offset, so we make happy little marks. <laughs> Contour checks, like I said, they're the same as well. Um, I'm just gonna run through these here, bones, muscle, fat, and skin. 
and I'll slow down on the, uh, the actual traumatic wound. So normally on a 3D medical model, you're not gonna see a differentiation in these uh, contours, but when you're simulating something, obviously it's gonna be different. So there's two different ways that we create the mold uh, at Geisinger. The box, so you literally just put a box around your part, subtract the box out, you have the mold and then you can split it up, label it, whatever you need to do. It does uh, use a lot more material, but it is a lot stabler and easier to clamp and fill. But if you're looking into using less material, we've done the, this hollow method as well. So you literally hollow the outside of your part and that, and then subtract that part from it. So you have like a nice little shell. And this is just us splitting it up and adding the fill holes, the exhaust holes, all that. And honestly, it's model dependent and user preference. So we use both for different uh, reasons. On this leg, it's probably a lot easier to use the box since it's a weird, uh, weird bottom to it, but either way works for us. So post-print processing and prep, there is a little more prep involved for the, for the mold. We like to use our binder jetting printer. The neat thing about the powder is it kind of has a matte finish when you're done. So it's perfect for skin if you're going to be simulating any kind of skin. The big thing that you have to remember though is the inside of that mold is going to be the outside finish of your model. So if you have layer lines, you want to sand those out, um, preferably before color bonding as well. And then you can use a release agent. Um, we've noticed in the past that if you have a new, brand new printed mold, you're probably going to want to use it. But after one or two times pouring, uh, you really don't need it. And these are just the molds of that lower leg. So from left to right, you can see uh, the muscle, the fat, and the skin layers, and positioning pegs to hold them all together. So how do you plan your pour? Um, we tend to use Smooth On, it's just a really easy product, but there's three different things that you have to keep in mind when you're doing this. Shore value, what, how, how much do you want that uh, silicone to flex or how much do you not want it to flex. Pot life is how long you have to work with that silicone, and cure time is the amount of time before you completely remove that out of the mold. So once you figure out those three things, um, this is a really nice little chart here, then you just use whatever silicone it tells you. So, sealing the seams. We have used clay in the past with, with success, and unfortunately without success. Um, I was actually out at Mayo and we were talking about this and how frustrating it is. Sometimes it's 100% great and sometimes it's not. And I just, I don't know what we could do different. I was like, I almost wonder if we can use hot glue. Like, can we use a hot glue? And this model is actually completely filled and poured and I'm just holding it up in the air. It's, I highly recommend it. Um, definitely stay away from it with FDM if you're gonna be doing it, obviously, because it's gonna be warping your mold and stuff, but for a binder jet printer, it works great. The other thing you wanna do is you wanna hold tension on that mold. We've used clamps, and as you can see, we've used tourniquets too. So our print lab is right next to CT, and since I'm a radiology base, I just tend to use like medical medical supplies. So the first couple of times, I'm like, just put tourniquets on. <laughs> but honestly, it's whatever works for you guys. So, mixing. Uh, with Smooth On, it's really nice because it's equal parts, but just follow the recommendations of whatever silicone you're going to use. I tend to use a digital scale still. Um, you pour one part in, then you put your, uh, your pigment in, mix the pigment around, pour the other part in, and then you should be good to go. So a really important step in any of these simulation models is the gassing. So you have to use a vacuum chamber, vacuum pump. This is just showing it going here. I don't know why it didn't blow up. But. And the big thing to remember when you're degassing is to not fill your containers. Don't even fill them halfway because you're going to have a huge mess. Anytime you degas, the level rises. And so I, I, I try to go up about below half. So after you degas your silicone, you're ready to pour. And like I said, I'm Sorry, I don't know why that's sideways, but <laughs> I'm in a medical background and I just really like uh, syringes. You have a lot more control. Um, 
and it just seems to not introduce any more error into things. So once your model is cured, uh, you can remove it. Sometimes that's a lot harder than, it's, uh, what, than you think it's going to be. So we really like using wedges. Just be careful though because uh, there's going to be some times where you're going to break your form, you're pulling a little bit too much. And like I said, honestly, it's trial and error. You'll feel when it starts to give. You'll feel when it's not, and you're going to break your mold a little bit. Yeah, it's, I mean, this is how Geisinger has been doing it. Like, the, just mess around and see, see what works for you. So, so there's the finished model. And this is probably about five minutes after we took it out of the mold completely. And like I said, we're radiology based, so I'm sitting there thinking, man, I really wish we could CT this. Or what's, what, what would this look like? So we took it right over to CT. Not a scan. some images from it. So there's your scalp. That's the CT. And then since I'm the lead tech in the 3D imaging lab as well, we put it in a terror recon and got some 3D reconstructions. And on that bottom left window you can actually see the bone sticking through the wound. So I thought that was crazy. Another uh, mold that I'm working on, a simulation model, is uh, for amniocentesis. And I just want to say I'm still working on this, but I wanted to share because it's pretty neat. This is kind of under construction. Anywhere from when we get a request for a 3D printed model, or a simulation model, or a prototyping model, the main question that I ask uh, the, the person requesting is like, what is your ultimate goal? What is your ultimate goal for that model? What do you want that to do? So for this amniocentesis simulation model, there was a decent amount of goals, but one was the ability to use ultrasound has to handle multiple needle sticks. We can't just have this as a one-off. It needs the ability to refill or change out fluid, make it a little more viscous if they need. Obviously, it has to look a little bit lifelike. And they wanted it to include a fetus. And make sure if they do, if it does start to leak, that I can get them another one within a day. So let's make sure it's easily reproducible. So after I had this meeting over in our simulation center, I'm walking out and next to the garbage is this. So they were throwing these out. Um, obviously I grabbed it and I'm walking through the hall with this thing, but <laughs> it saved a lot of time with our amniocentesis model because then you're not 3D printing that part. So you don't always have to print every single part, like use whatever you can. And these are just some images of where about I am right now. So. We cut out the opening, we have the amniotic sac. There is actually a fetus in there and we filled it with the fluid. And then I designed like a baby bottle that's ultrasound. When we were working on this model, and I'm sorry, I don't know why these are all picking up sideways, but uh, this is a small scale of the amniotic sac as the ultrasound tech is compressing. And this is actually where we are now. So we have uh, something that shows almost like a fetus uh, skull in the amniotic sac itself. So we're getting there. So some key takeaways from molding, um, in my mind, keep the goal of the model in mind. I mean, that's for 3D printing even too, but just remember our job is to take whatever that person requesting has in their mind and make it a reality and get that to them. So just keep that in mind when you're designing anything. Make sure you have a healthy part. If you have a healthy part, you're gonna have a healthy mold and it's gonna make a really successful model. Be resourceful and creative. Use what you have at first, test it out. Collaborate and learn together. Um, I'm really blessed that we have like such a great, you know, community 3D printing and bouncing ideas off each other. And that's the only way we're all gonna grow at this is to keep collaborating and honestly have fun with it. I love this quote. I don't think this pertains to anything more than 3D printing right now. Like it's not the sky is the limit, it's our minds. So let's just keep creating things together and uh, keep pushing the envelope. I just want to thank everybody that was helping me out with this. And
resource. It's, it's really, really cool. So yeah, we all want to learn this. Yeah, collaboration is a big thing. Um, but honestly, it's just trial and error and things that I think randomly, like, why don't we use, you know, a syringe instead of a funnel? Or why don't, and then I'll test that out and, you know, talk to people about it. And really cool. Trial and error. Thank you. 